Well, hello and welcome, everybody. I'm Scott Sims, Director of Communications for BPA, and I'm very glad you could all join us today. Uh, this media call has been organized by the Bonneville Power Administration and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Army Northwestern, Army Division, Northwestern Division, both located in Portland, Oregon. We're providing facts and information to media about current and recent federal Columbia River base, uh, Basin fish abundance, southern resident killer whales, and federal dam operations in the Pacific Northwest today. I'll further address why we're having this call in a minute, but first a few technical details related to the call itself. After this introduction, we're going to hear three presentations. First, from Kristen Jewell, Fish and Wildlife Policy Analyst for the Bonneville Power Administration. Second, Beth Coffey, Chief of Civil Works Integration Division for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Northwestern Division. And third, Kieran Connolly, Senior Vice President of VPA Generation Asset Management. Uh, when all those presentations are done, there will be a facilitated question and answer period where we can discuss what has been presented and other topics of interest to you. As you all know, webinars can be a bit tricky with the sound and potential interruptions from people calling in. So to make it easier for everybody, we're going to basically mute all callers while the presentations are being made. And we get to the question and answer period, we're going to unmute the phones and manage our way through the questions. I ask you to bear with us as we manage the technology and the inflow, inflow of your questions. So back to the reason for this call. It's safe to say that everyone who's heard about the issue of the struggling orca whale populations in the Pacific Northwest are truly saddened by the plight of these spectacular mammals. There's been a lot of powerful and emotional reporting and social media activity on this topic. And many of you on this call have been actively engaged in following this topic closely, so you have firsthand experience of the seriousness of the issue. As federal agencies, we have a tremendous responsibility to do what's right for the people and the natural resources of the Pacific Northwest. And it's our responsibility to inform and participate in factual discussions that support balancing our multiple public responsibilities within a vast and complex ecosystem. We're calling on everyone who's interested in this issue to become fully informed on all the causes and potential solutions before jumping to any conclusions. And as well, we're committed to providing the latest scientific information, finding common ground, and identifying solutions to address the orca's decline. So we get our fair share of calls from journalists who ask us to engage on issues around the future state, and admittedly, we've been a little quiet on that front. That's been out of respect to an important public process playing out that is looking at the potential future operations of the Columbia River Basin resources. In long form, it's called the Columbia River System Operations Environmental Impact Statement, or CRSO EIS. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Bureau of Reclamation, and the Bonneville Power Administration are currently working in that process. The three agencies will present a reasonable range of alternatives for long-term system operations of the Columbia River Basin. We'll evaluate the potential environmental and socioeconomic impacts on flood risk management, irrigation, power generation, navigation, fish and wildlife, culture resources, and recreation. So the comments you hear today are really about the facts of today and the past without predetermining the outcome of the EIS. Also, if you're on this call, you may likely have known or heard about Washington Governor Jay Inslee's task force that's focused on the Southern Resident Killer Whale issue. As part of this forum, BPA, the Corps of Engineers, and NOAA Fisheries were invited to present at a webinar on September 27th, and some of you may have participated in that. After our presentations, we heard from many people that the information we provided was intriguing and, in fact, was new to some. And that's why the idea or where the idea of hosting this media call came from. We, the federal agencies, thought this call would be a good opportunity to share more details and provide time for questions and answers. And so with that long intro, let me turn it now to Kristen Jewell of BPA, and she is a, again, fish and wildlife policy analyst. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for the introduction. And as Scott mentioned, I am the Fish and Wildlife Policy and Planning Manager at BPA. A little bit about BPA's Fish and Wildlife Program. We administer the largest fish and wildlife mitigation program in the United States. We're fulfilling the requirement as defined by the Northwest Power Act. Other responsibilities, such as tribal trust, and meeting the compliance needs for Endangered Species Act and, and NEPA. <clears throat> we do our work primarily through partnerships with tribes, other federal agencies, states, other local and nonprofit entities. And the work that we are doing is really helping to reshape the Columbia Basin now and for generations to come. According to NOAA experts, in terms of abundance, abundance of salmon available for the southern resident killer whales, the prey, Populations of Snake River stocks are now greater than they were in the 1960s before the four Lower Snake dams were built. 
Many of the efforts of BPA and our tribal and state and federal partners have contributed to the increased abundance trend. For example, juvenile fish passage through the federal dams has increased significantly as a result of the physical and operational changes made at these facilities. Juvenile salmon and steelhead outmigration survival rates and travel times from the Columbia and Snake Rivers is close to what would be encountered in undammed river systems. Other fish and other species have benefited from the extensive habitat restoration projects we and our partners do. Uh, additionally, we also fund hatchery mitigation programs and conservation and safety net programs. As NOAA Fishery states in their uh, recent fact sheet, which I believe is on the NOAA website, the Columbia River is the largest source of natural and hatchery Chinook on the West Coast. So now we're going to shift briefly into the southern resident killer whale diet and distribution issue. Uh, no fishery scientists. Yeah, thank you. Um, the slide up here is a bit of a depiction, geographic and time depiction of where the southern resident killer whales are in relation to the Columbia and Snake River stocks and when the, the various pods, Southern Resident Killer Whale pods, J, K, and L, uh, only pods J and L are seen to come down towards the Columbia and Snake River estuary and um, are likely consuming Columbia and Snake River fish. <coughs> no fishery scientists maintain that recovering salmon stocks for killer whales was well beyond the, beyond the Columbia River Basin and the hatcheries produce more than enough Chinook in the basin to offset the losses caused by the dams. A recent study by NOAA Fisheries stating the top 10 priority Chinook populations for the southern resident killer whales illustrates this point very well. The study recently published fact sheet, uh, as I mentioned before, is also on their website. As we continue to learn, there are many factors that lead to the current health and population trends for the southern resident killer whales. This includes travel noise, vessels, uh, toxics in the ocean, uh, prey consumption is just one of many factors contributing to the status of the southern resident killer whales. Um, next slide. Uh, this graph is just for your benefit. It, it has the purple line um, up on top and that's the status of the southern resident killer whales. The graph is for the Snake River Chinook um, returning to lower granite. And we just wanted to point out that this graphic here shows that the trend for the southern resident killer whales it isn't just related to the trends of the Snake River Columbia returning fish. As we think about these complicated natural resources issues, we really need to ensure that we understand the problem so that when we choose a solution, it is actually going to have the most positive effect that we're, that we're striving for. We strongly believe that science should be the basis for our discussion and the foundation of our decision. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chris. Now let's turn to Beth Coffey. Thank you for this opportunity today um, to address what the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and our federal partners have been doing in regards to our current efforts with the EIS um, within the Columbia River system, as well as some address some specific issues and questions that we've been receiving regarding the Lower Snake River Dam. So focusing your attention on this first slide, this lays out where we are with the EIS process. Um, so as Scott stated at the very beginning, we are currently undertaking um, a EIS that was um, in response to Judge Simon's opinion and order in May of 2016. Uh, the core reclamation and BPA have initiated this EIS as of September of 2016. We held 16 scoping meetings throughout the basin and received over 400,000 scoping letters. Many of those letters stated interest in removal of the Lower Snake River projects. In our May of 2018 public meeting, we informed the region that breaching of the four Lower Snake River dams is one of the alternatives that is being examined in this EIS. We now have over uh, 30 cooperating uh, agencies participating in this process and this includes the state of Washington um, agencies as well as a number of um, tribal nations. So this chart depicts where we are. Uh, we have gone through, as I stated, the scoping process. We have developed a suite of alternatives, which includes looking at breaching the Lower Snake River dams. And we are currently in the process of doing detailed analysis. That 
analysis will look at, among other things, um, in regards to dam breaching, the sequence of actions necessary to safely breach the projects, the physical, biological, social, and economic impacts of, that, nice. of those actions, estimated cost of dam breaching, as well as do an analysis of the capacity of the existing uh, rail and roadways um, so that we can do an analysis of what will happen if we were to breach those dams and shift that uh, transport of commerce from the waterways to our roads and rail. So per the court order, the draft EIS is scheduled to be released um, in the spring of 2020 for public review and comment. And the final EIS in March of 2021 with a record of a decision in September of 2021. So moving forward to the next slide. Um, I wanted to clarify two um, um, statements. We have, in, within the region, you've heard of both dam removal and dam breaching. Um, dam removal um, is looking at the total removal of all physical features of the project to include the soil embankment, the concrete spillway, the navigation locks and guide walls, and the powerhouse. Dam breaching refers to the removal of the soil embankment, but also other necessary actions uh, will need to be taken, such as looking at the impacts of spillway, navigation locks, and powerhouse that is left in place, and how the river is routed um, around those facilities. So this slide also depicts um, this is from um, page 19 of the Lower Snake River Juvenile Salmon Mitigation Feasibility Report and Environmental Impact Statement that was completed in 2002. Um, this notes many of the engineering considerations for removing the embankment and the breaching of the dam. In the Appendix D of the uh, 2002 study and the EIS provides a list of engineering factors developed at the time and using what we understood then about the dam breaching. We've also will need to consider, as we look at it now, to consider the operations of the dam itself and the short and long-term safety factors to do a controlled drawdown. In addition to looking at the engineering designs to breach the dams, we need to consider the safety of the, of the existing infrastructure, uh, bridge pier protection, industrial and municipal outfall relocation, intakes for irrigation, water supply, the impacts of road and um, railroad embankments, as well as sediment dispersal. So when we look at even the um, dam breaching, there are a lot of things that we will need to take in consideration. And we did back in um, 2002, and we will again as we look at this alternative in the current EIS analysis. One of the questions um, has also come up about, you know, what is the cost of dam breaching? Um, what, how that, um, what are the actions we would undertake? The work of the current um, EIS, as I just explained, will re-examine all the cost assumptions and uncertainty uh, for both cost and schedule that is inherent to any planning effort, especially when a period of implementation may span decades. And while um, the 16 year old, um, 16 years ago, we did do a cost estimate in the 2002 study and EIS. Um, we know that those costs will need to be updated as we do this current EIS, and we will assess those costs. Next slide. The other question that we have been um, getting is in regards to uh, authority. Breaching or removal of the Lower Snake River dams will require congressional authorization. The Corps has consistently said that since the concept of dam breaching was raised in the early 1990s, that we would need authorization to take those actions. Uh, we do not have any standing authority to, to eliminate a project use that, the, that Congress has authorized and the Corps to um, authorize the Corps to construct and to operate. I know that some have indicated the Corps has authority to breach these dams. You have but reached the maximum time permitted for recording your message. If you are satisfied with your but message, I wanted to press reassert one to that listen we will to your need message. That authorization. Press two to erase and re For the Corps, congressional authorization is usually accomplished through a Water Resource Development Act. Recently, Congress has been trying to pass these bills every two years. The typical steps for a report to be prepared for review and approval through our core head goes through our core headquarters to the assistant secretary of army for civil works 
then to the Office of Management and Budget for the administration to support the authorization. At this time, it would be submitted to Congress for their um, consideration and ultimate authorization. Once we would receive authorization, we would then need the um, funding to be able to do, take any action from um, design through construction of this action. So we do need um, both authorization and funding to be able to move forward with any type of dam breaching. So hopefully this explains a little bit more about the core processes and some of the engineering considerations that we need to consider um, as we move forward with this EIS um, and also clarifies that it is not something that we can do immediately. It will take several years to be able to implement um, once we get this authorization and funding. Thank you. Beth, thanks very much. Let's turn it over now to Kieran Connolly. Thank you for joining this call. Uh, as Scott has mentioned, my name is Kieran Connolly. Uh, the CRSO EIS uh, that has already been discussed will also examine impacts to the electric system, including reliability impacts, costs, and the impacts on programs that the Bonneville Power Administration ad administers. Uh, my comments today are drawn from analysis <coughs> conducted prior to the initiation of the EIS and other public sources in order to provide some perspective without predetermining the outcome of that EIS. Uh, I'll cover the significance of the power produced from the four lower Snake River dams, the relevance of the carbon-free attributes of that power, and the economic value that is created by that power. On this first slide, uh, we'll, we'll speak to the electricity output of the four Snake River dams and, the, and its affordability. On this chart, the levelized cost of generation, the projects that make up the Federal Columbia River Power System, or FCRPS, are arrayed. The vertical axis shows the cost per megawatt, and the horizontal axis is the volume of energy that each one of the projects produces. Each of the four snake dams has a forecasted levelized cost through 2030, including expense and capital costs, in the range of 10 to $14 per megawatt hour. If you look at the circle here on the chart, that's where those dams uh, can be found. These are some of the most affordable power resources in the federal power system and in fact in the Pacific Northwest region. Below the depressed market prices that have hovered between 20 and 25 dollars per megawatt hour in recent years and certainly below the cost of replacement resources. The financial benefits from these dams flow to Northwest electricity customers, the residential and small farm customers of Northwest investor-owned utilities, and a number of other benefits, including, as was mentioned earlier, the nation's largest fish and wildlife program and one of the world's most successful energy efficiency programs. In summary, the cost of producing electricity from the Federal Columbia River power system is low, and the Snake River dams support those low costs. Moving to my next slide, uh, the four dams produce about 1,000 average megawatts of electricity each year. For reference, the average annual output of these resources is roughly equal to the electricity consumed by the businesses, industries, and households of Seattle City Light over the course of a year. This slide shows both the energy output as well as the st sustainable capacity of these projects by month. The blue bars reflect the average electricity produced each month. This output typically grows from about 800 megawatts to 1,200 average megawatts across the winter and peaks in the spring. Additionally, the gray shaded area on this chart reflects the ability of these generators to meet the need when required. See the right access for the peaking scale. These four dams have the ability to sustain 2,700 to 3,100 megawatts of peaking power for up to 120 hours a month during the fall winter or spring months. This energy and capacity make the Snake River dams an important component of the FCRPS as we seek to meet the multiple purposes of the dams under a variety of conditions. This is the kind of carbon-free power resource that helps power Northwest households and industries during multi-day cold snaps in the winter. Finally, the state of Washington and the state of states of Oregon and California have ambitious goals for decarbonizing the electric grid. This means increasing reliance on non-carbon resources to produce electricity. 
Wind is one resource to meet these goals that has been relied upon heavily in the Pacific Northwest and probably will be into the future. Wind generation is not directed by the needs of consumers. Instead, the output varies depending on location and our Northwest weather. Let me show you what it looked like last week. The green line on the bottom of this chart shows that wind resources in, or actually I should say a couple of weeks ago, I'm sorry. The wind resources in Bonneville system stopped producing power for most of two plus days. Hydropower, including the four Snake River dams, played an important role in offsetting this multi-day variability. As West Coast states pursue decarbonizing their economies as well as their electricity systems, it will include switching other fossil fuel uses to electricity, like reducing gasoline consumption and transportation in favor of electric vehicles. This transition will further increase the demand for additional carbon-free generation, and much, much of it will require capacity support. Many parts of the nation look with great envy at the Pacific Northwest Hydro Fleet and its carbon-free capacity. That capacity is valuable to help this region incorporate new carbon-free technologies. In this region, the Snake River dams are an existing resource that can help meet those needs for the people of, of the Pacific Northwest. In closing, the Snake River dams are currently an important part of enabling Bonneville to provide benefits to the region. They produce power at low cost that enables economic development. They help fund programs important to the values of the Pacific Northwest. They provide reliability to the electric system during times of need, and they can be an important part of decarbonization in the future if we choose to retain them. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Kristen, Beth, and Kieran. Really appreciate this. And as I foreshadowed in the beginning of the call, we're going to be advancing to the Q&A section, and we do uh, ask for your uh, forgiveness as we try to uh, transition through the technology here. I've got some of my colleagues in the room to help uh, with some of the Q&As that are streaming in from the web. And what we'll do out of respect of your time is take up to 3 p.m. Pacific today uh, to answer uh, your questions. And uh, believe me, uh, I would say this is just the beginning. We're happy to... Uh, uh, continue to engage with you either through our media staff or through um, the fact sheet that was mentioned from NOAA earlier, et cetera. So with that, uh, do we have a first question that's come in? None. Okay, we do have one question. Seattle Times has asked, where can I download this presentation? So I believe we're going to be um, uh, creating a, some sort of a public archive. We did have a little bit of it. That's why we foreshadowed the difficulty of the WebEx today. We had a little bit of a difficulty with the recording of this session, so we will be uh, providing that back through our media representative about how to get an access to, uh, to this presentation. Okay. Other questions that may be streaming in? Hi, this is Sue Romero from Como Radio in Seattle. Hi, Sue. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Um, so is the purpose of the, um, of the call and the information that you're releasing um, in response to the attention that the orca whales have been getting and, then, and that one of the ideas is to breach the dams and, and um, to provide more food for the orca whales? I think the reason that you're hearing us uh, speak is that last week at the Governor Inslee Task Force, when we provided information publicly uh, in that forum and had been sort of a, had been, as I said earlier, fairly quiet in terms of the federal presence, there were a lot of folks who were very interested in what we had to share, particularly from uh, NOAA and some of the uh, information about abundance and availability of those fish stocks and the production uh, value from uh, the Columbia River Basin. And so from that, we decided that with that heightened interest and in, uh, request from stakeholders, we figured we would provide uh, provide more information to media. We also ourselves have watched some of the, the media coverage and frankly have seen you know some missing pieces. I can speak specifically on behalf of BPA in this factor. Um, some assumptions about uh, the power production as, as Kieran was sharing earlier, um, some of the dynamics that happen with wind integration and the capacity value of the hydro resources. And so those things in, um, I'd say, in a compounding effect uh, made it necessary and, and made us want to make sure to get out there with uh, some facts for folks. Um, if I may, a follow-up question. What do you think are the biggest misinterpretations of people who think that breaching or removing a dam would be a good idea to save the orca whales? Let me turn this over to the panel and see if we have some folks who want to jump in on that one. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, repeat the question, please. 
Uh, what do you think one of the biggest piece or pieces of misinformation is out there um, among the people who believe that removing a dam or breaching a dam is the answer to save the orca whales? I, I think one of the things that we wanted to clarify, and, and maybe we can move back to the slide regarding the, the geographic location of the orca killer whales and uh, where and when they're consuming Columbia snake River stocks. I think one of the things that we really wanted to be able to identify was that while we recognize that southern resident killer whales do consume Columbia and Snake River stocks, they're really not the limiting prey for these species. And they are utilizing this prey source certain times of the year and um, only some of the pods, uh, in particular the, the J pod that was under so much scrutiny this summer is actually not one of the pods that comes down to the Columbia River and, and consumes um, Columbia and sacred stocks. So I think that the connection between the uh, abundance of uh, the Columbia and River stocks to the orcas' well-being and their contributing to their status, I think we wanted to clarify that point. And this is Beth Coffey. Okay. I would also like to add um, to that, the Corps of Engineers does have a lot of um, ac uh, authorized projects within the Puget Sound area. Um, these are projects that are ongoing, um, either in construction, design, or study to directly help those salmon stocks that Christian just talked about. Um, we are currently um, constructing the Mud Mountain uh, Dam Fish Passage Project, which will provide um, you know, passage um, for um, Chinook salmon in particular, as well as other species of salmon. And we're also in design or approaching design phase for the Skokomish River, which is going to restore year round salmon access to the South Fork of the Skokomish River, restoring over 270 acres um, for the four listed salmon runs within that area. We have authorization um, to do the Puget Sound Nearshore um, project, which is large scale um, projects within the nearshore of the Puget Sound. Again, has that direct connection with salmon and orca. Um, so we have a lot of activities within the Puget Sound um, that are ongoing and have um, the authority and have the potential to move out quickly or are moving out quickly to provide um, benefits to salmon recovery. Um, you know, when we talk about the Snake River dams, that is more of a longer term uh, analysis that we will do through the EIS. And so it does not provide that more immediate solution to those salmon that are in that immediate area of the, of the orcas. And that's uh, those great points, uh, Kristen and Beth. I think uh, Kieran wants to add something to here. Let me just quickly say on an administrative front, uh, star six to unmute to ask questions. Okay, Kieran. And I guess the, the thing I will add is that I think we were feeling that there was a narrative from some corners that the impacts to the electric system would be negligible, and we wanted to point out that there are would be real impacts on the electric side, both in terms of cost and otherwise, um, that would need to be taken into account if you were going to take this action. So in summary, I think you're hearing about um, Snake River and uh, Columbia River production abundance. I uh, really encourage folks to look for the NOAA information. Certainly we've heard NOAA spokespeople quoted as saying it's a bright spot among the West Coast fisheries. Um, so definitely would encourage folks to seek out that. You're hearing about breaching timeline and uh, th that being a longer term solution, whereas Puget Sound actions that are in play are basically ready to roll here, uh, either in motion now or very soon. And uh, lastly, of course, the um, hydroelectric value of these uh, resources and what they put out to the region today and yesterday. So um, let's go to our next question. I have a follow-up for Kristen. Yes. Hi, Kristen. This is Linda Mapes at the Seattle Times. It, it sounded as if your answer to uh, KOW was that these Snake and Columbia River stocks are irrelevant to the orca whales and their recovery. 
and no. their well-being. Is that truly your statement? No, no. I would not say that they are irrelevant. I would say that they Please are Please clarify. Yeah, sorry. So I th thank you for following up if, if, if you misheard or if I got misrepresented. No, I think that they are, they are relevant stocks for the southern resident killer whales. I guess the, the point that we wanted to make is that geographically and timing, they are, they are not the key limiting of resource or prey for the southern resident killer whales. The only, um, and, and to top that off, basically we're saying that trends for the status of these stocks have been increasing over time. So right now, they are the most consistent prey source for the southern resident killer whale. I'm just curious what you're basing your conclusion on what is or isn't a, a key stock to them. Those spring Chinook runs to the Columbia River, we see K-Pods sitting out there during the hungriest time of the year. They're there to get those fish. On what, on what are you basing your statement that those are not key to those animals' needs? Let, let's introduce, uh, thank you, Linda, for that. And I know you've had some additional touch points with NOAA recently where they've deep dived into some of these fish stocks and their availability and their abundance. Uh, in fact, as early as this morning. Let's turn to Dim, Tim Dykstra, a biologist for the Corps of Engineers, who can provide a little bit more detail here uh, on this matter. Yeah, hey, thanks. This is Tim Dykstra. And, and I think one of, one of the main points here is that this recent report from NOAA and Washington has identified 15 stocks of Chinook that are important to orcas. And and what uh, Ms. Coffey highlighted was several projects in the Puget Sound that would provide you know, significant benefits to some of those populations that are identified as the most critical. You, you contrast that with focusing on Snake River dams, where Snake River dams have an impact on two of the 15 Chinook populations, the, the, two of the 15 stocks of Chinook. And so removal or breach of uh, Snake River dams at, at best can provide a potential incremental benefit to two of those 15 Chinook stocks. And, and to further that point, thanks, Sam. To further that point, those two stocks are, are also doing quite well. Snake River Falchonic is on the highest numbers that we've had for, for decades. Um, so I think that the trend in those stocks are, are not showing a decline at this point in time. Great. Additional questions? Actually, that's not true. I mean, if you've looked at the returns this year for spring Chinook, they're not, I mean, they're in a deep dive, and the jack counts are terrible. But anyway, I mean, everyone knows that these animals prey on a wide range of fish. That's what makes this so difficult uh, for, for you all who are trying to manage this problem. Um, I just was getting the impression from what you were saying that these fish aren't important to them. And if you look at the, at the rankings, and I have them in front of me, I mean, the Snake River fish are in the top 10 twice over. And I think, you know, what's funny, Linda, it's interesting. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I was born and raised in outside Seattle. It's funny to think about family members of mine who've scuba dived in Pacific Sound, uh, sorry, Puget Sound over the years and to see up close the abundance 20 years ago of a lot of wildlife and to now see the total degradation. I think a lot of the stuff that we were talking about earlier today, the, the vessel noise, the pollution, a lot of things that have been happening in Puget Sound. I think that's, you know, one of the things that uh, has been really uh, evident is to make sure that folks can hear from NOAA and others about um, the degradation and issues that have been happening in the Puget Sound and, uh, and sort of what's playing out across the West Coast. As you know, as we've been saying today, there is no one easy solution. So let's go to another, uh, another point or another question here. Oh, Kristen, do you have a follow-up point you want to make? Oh, the trend light. She's going to address the tr trend light. You want to touch, talk about the trend? Right, right. And I, so I, I just wanted to follow up on that point regarding the trends. You know, we typically don't work at just one year of data to inform us on the status of the species. It's generally the trends. And, and salmon and steelhead are known for their cyclic, uh, you know, cyclic trend survival over time. And so I think when, we're, when we say that there's an increasing trend, that's what we're referring to. We're funding over the past, past decade. Yeah, it depends on what you're talking about. I mean, the smolt to adult returns for those particular runs of fish, the Snake River Chinook, I mean, those are not on a path to recovery, according to the Power Planning Council. I mean, we're supposed to be above two, and we're not even anywhere close to it, and we never have been. Right, and I, I think the reason why we're kind of generally bringing up this topic is it, it's more about kind of the relevance and the short-term need for the southern resident killer whales that, that we're really looking at immediate 
immediate benefits for them and, and, and how can we alleviate some of the immediate stressors on them. And I, I think our point is saying that given that abundance trends right now are, are stable or increasing here, that there might be other areas that we can look at to, to be pursuing solution, near-term solutions. Great, thank you, Kristen. I mean, maybe for the hatchery fish, but not for the wild fish. Well, yeah, I think that's one of the concerns that uh, we need to consider. You know, as, as one of the one of the task force recommendations potentially is to increase uh, hatchery production, and it has to be weighed against the benefits and, and the risks to natural origin fish. Great, thanks, Kristen. Let's uh, hear from some other folks who might have some questions for us today. Certainly know we've had some questions that have come to BPA regarding the uh, low carbon aspects of hydroelectric production and uh, just waiting for other folks here to, uh, to provide some, some questions. But um, Kieran and team look uh, very closely at making sure to have reliable power flowing across the, the lines here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, one of the issues has been around renewable power integration over the years and over 5,000 megawatts, is it, of wind power that's been uh, integrated over the recent years? Uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Karen, do you want to just maybe mention a little bit about the value of the Lower Snake River dams from a power integration, uh, sorry, from a uh, renewable integration standpoint? Uh, thanks, Scott. So yes, uh, the, the Bonneville system and the numbers go up and down as resources uh, move in and out of how they choose to interconnect to the grid, but we've interconnected over 5,000 megawatts of wind into the Bonneville system and the Pacific Northwest uh, has put up over 7,500 megawatts of uh, wind generation in the last 10 plus years. And the, the integration of those resources, the role that the Snake River dams play in, in that, uh, they do play a role. Uh, the federal system is operated as a system of dams. Uh, we are able to take advantage of timing in terms of when river flows are higher or lower in either the Snake or the Columbia. Uh, we look at those resources differently during those different times of the year and figure out where can we, where do we want to maximize energy production and where do we want to have flexible capacity set aside? How does that fit with the other uses of the system, uh, particularly our objectives for fish and wildlife? So having the entire suite of the federal system gives us the ability to both meet base load electric demand, provide flexibility to respond to things like variation in wind output, uh, while meeting other important objectives, whether that be fish and wildlife flows, uh, providing for uh, recreation opportunities, uh, maintaining flows for navigation, et cetera. Uh, so the snakes are an important piece in that, so we'll at times load energy production on the snake to free up other resources like John Day Dam or Grand Coulee Dam to take swings uh, from variable resources. Uh, at another time of the year when we need to move a lot of water out of uh, through the lower river and say that John Day Dam needs to have its generation maximized, uh, we may have available capacity on the snake to take some of the swings. So that's when we move back and forth. Great. Thank you, Kieran. Beth? Yes, I just wanted to elaborate on a couple of points. Um, one, you know, as we talk about um, the system, over the um, past several decades, there has been a lot of changes to how we operate the system um, that we have adopted for under, under um, subsequent ESA consultations and project-specific NEPA documents. In January 2017, the Corps of Engineers Bureau of Reclamation Bonneville Power Administration issued the 2016 Federal Columbia River Power System Comprehensive Evaluation that describes the eight years of progress implementing the NOAA um, Fisheries Biological Opinion for the operation of the Federal Columbia uh, Power System for ESA listed salmon and steelhead. This publication outlines um, the agency's accomplishments thus far in dam passage improvements, habitat restorations, hatchery reform, and predator management, as well as the status of the fish. Um, in addition, there's a 2016 Citizen's Guide that summarizes highlights of the comprehensive evaluation in pictures, maps, and, gra and graphs, and that is located on the salmonrecovery.gov site. These are resources to you to kind of look at what has been done within the system, because um, there has 
been a lot of investment to salmon recovery in the Columbia River system. I also wanted to take a little opportunity to kind of go through a little bit more on the Corps authorities. Um, as I stated in the presentation, we do not have the authorization for um, dam removal or dam breaching. But, you know, we do have authorities, as I articulated, in Puget Sound that are directly related to, to salmon recovery. And so that is one of our key focuses in the core is looking at those projects and how to keep moving them forward. Um, another thing that has come up um, regarding, you know, core's authorities has been whether or not we could put these four facilities, the four Lower Snake River dams, into a non-operational um, status. And when the Corps looks at that, it's a very deliberative process we, we go through when we look at a project to put them in a non-operational status. Um, some of the key considerations we look at are, one, is that project still um, providing benefits for the project purposes that it's been authorized to accomplish? So, for uh, example, the the Lower Snake River dams provide a navigation purpose, they provide recreation, they provide hydropower uh, and fish and wildlife. Those are four main purposes they were authorized to. They are still providing benefits to those purposes, such as navigation um, and hydropower. So that is, so based on that criteria, um, they would not meet uh, um, that process for going to make them non-operational. Another factor we look at with um, making a project non-operational is if we have a safety concern. So if a project has major dam safety or structural issues that we do not believe it's safe to operate that project for those project purposes, that is another thing we would consider uh, for non-operational. We still would have to do an evaluation. We would still have to you know, look at the impacts of that um, decision. So it is not something that we can just quickly make happen. So I just wanted to kind of clarify a couple of those points. Thank you, Beth, appreciate that. Do we have other uh, questions on the phone? Yes, this is Casey Mahaffey with Clearing Up. Hi, Casey, how are you? Good, good. Um, so I've seen um, on, on the Dam Sense website, it talks about, um, let's see, I guess that the Army Corps of Engineers could breach the dams under the 2002 EIS. Um, alternative. So can you explain, um, and it sounds like you're saying that is not possible, can you explain why that is? And also um, this estimate of $80 million in five years to completion, can you address um, your thoughts on on that um, estimate by Sam Sam? So um, this is Beth Coffee again. Um, since go regarding the 2002 environmental impact statement and um, a record of decision, um, you are correct that um, we do not have the authorization um, from um, that effort to breach or remove the dams. Um, since dam breaching was not selected as the action, the recommended um, alternative for the, the 2002 study in EIS, we did not complete a detailed uh, pre-construction and design plans at a level that would be sufficient to move this directly into construction without additional NEPA activities. In addition, because it was not selected, we did not, it did not go forward to, um, for seeking authorization from Congress. So um, the plan that was approved in the 2002 or recommended did not require any additional authorization to implement, and that was the one that was selected and moved forward. Um, dam breaching, because it wasn't selected, was we did not um, request or submit additional study and evaluation to Congress to seek that authorization. Great. And what about cost? Do you think the cost, um, you know, of eighty million is at all um, even in the ballpark? So we have, um, as far as looking at the cost of this, we the.